Lebanon is perceived to be one of the Arab world's freest countries. But over the last two years, we've witnessed a really alarming increase in attacks on peaceful speech and expression. And this attack in this increase in attacks on speech has coincided with expressions of popular disillusionment with corruption, the mismanagement of public funds, and a worsening economic situation. So every time we start seeing you know, more criticism of the government, you know, people getting more angry about corruption, more angry about the economic situation, we see a backlash from the government against free speech in the country with, you know, the aim of silencing, silencing criticism. Mm -hmm. And one of the most potent tools that powerful political and religious figures have used to silence criticism and silence their opponents are our criminal defamation and insult laws. Right. Right. So these laws um, criminalize defamation against public officials and authorize imprisonment for up to one year uh, if you defame, defame a public official. If you insult the president, the flag, or the national emblem, you can be imprisoned for up to two years. And then if you insult the army, you can be imprisoned for up to three years. And then we have other laws that outlaw speech that's deemed to be insulting to religion or speech that incites sectarianism. We've had these laws on the books since Ottoman and French mandates eras. They're nothing new. Yeah. But what's new is the extent to which political uh, political figures, the public prosecutor, religious institutions are resorting to these laws uh, in order to target uh, target people who are criticizing them. One of the most telling numbers on you know the rate at which these prosecutions are increasing are numbers that we obtained from the Cyber Crimes Bureau in Lebanon. So the Cyber Crimes Bureau is a unit within the Internal Security Forces, the ISF, and it's specialized in combating cyber crime and enhancing online security. Um, however, they, in recent years, much of their work has centered around investigating defamation and insult cases on social media. Um, and the numbers that we got from them were really incredibly alarming. You know, we, for the past few years, we've been hearing, you know, 10, 20, up to 50 cases per year of journalists and activists be summoned in for investigation uh, over you know, their social media posts. But the numbers that we got from the Cyber Crimes Bureau showed that the problem was actually much bigger than we had previously anticipated. Hmm. So they told us their numbers that between 2015 and May of 2019, they investigated 3,599 cases relating to defamation, libel, and standard. Sorry, what were the dates again? What, were the, what was the time frame? Between January 2015 and May 2019. Over 3,000? 3,599 cases. And if that wow. number isn't alarming enough, the rate of increase is really quite alarming. So in 2015, the Bureau investigated 341 such cases. The year after that, 755. The year after that, 800. And in 2018, a whopping 1,451 defamation cases. Wow. So between 2015 and 2018, we saw a 325% increase in the number of investigations relating to defamation and insult. And this is before the protests began in October last year. So this is yes. just a, an increase despite the recent sort of expression. Yeah, this was predating the predating the protests. And our analysis of this is that after 2015, when there were the trash crisis protests and right. you know yeah. pretty large large scale um, expressions of public anger and accusations of corruption against the government. You know, the government then started to rely on these laws to silence their critics and mm. sue them for defamation. Um, and there are several problems with Lebanon's defamation laws uh, at, that makes them not compliant with international law. So first, they are criminal laws, which means that they're in the penal code. Uh, they appear on your, if you're charged with one of these crimes, uh, they appear on your criminal record. And most importantly, you can be sentenced to prison time uh, for committing defamation or insult or libel. Um, and these, you know, the, the Human Rights Committee 
which is the UN body that interprets the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, mm. um, has said that imprisonment for defamation is never proportional. So, you know, most countries are doing away with putting people in prison uh, for peaceful, peaceful speech. So right. that's the first problem with the law. The second problem with the law is that public officials are given special protection from defamation. So if you defame a public official, the penalties are higher than if you were to defame uh, a regular individual. And that's also against international principles because public figures should not have any special protection from defamation. Quite the opposite, actually, because they're in public positions, they, yeah. should, they are legitimately subject to public criticism. Um, and the third... Yeah, yeah no, please, please go ahead. Yes. Problem, this is, um, by, by, I'm just going to interrupt you for a second. This is the best introduction <laughs> I've ever had. I've done 180 episodes. This is the difference between Middle East <laughs> Studies from Harvard University and Middle East Studies AUB. I ask questions, you answer them. <laughs> so please. I mean, I've been working on this. I've been working on this for more than a year. So this no, but is, I, think, um, I think this is the best. I will just, the whole episode will just be this, and then I'll <laughs> sit back and like, that was great. So sorry, the third. I, I keep interrupting you, so that, that's my no, fault. Please. please, go ahead. Um, so the third uh, problem with the Lebanon's defamation laws is that truth is not always a defense. So even yeah. if what I say about you is true, I can be sentenced, you know, I, I can still be found guilty and sentenced to prison time. Right. And that's also quite alarming. And the fourth problem with Lebanon's criminal defamation laws, and I'll stop at the No, no, I, it's, it's worth <laughs> emphasizing all of them, please. So, yeah, the fourth. Um, <laughs> is that civilians that allegedly commit defamation against the army or insult any member of the military institution, including civilian employees of the military, um, are under the jurisdiction of the military court. Right, right. So they can be tried in military court. Um, and we, as Human Rights Watch, have documented some very serious due process concerns with the military court that have led us to make the conclusion that um, it's a human rights violation to try uh, citizen, Lebanese citizens in Lebanon's military court, given the formation of the court and given some of the uh, due process violations in, in the military court. These include the fact that the judges are not independent, they're appointed by the Ministry of Defense, that right. they don't necessarily have legal training. Um, that the, there's no, you know, three three tiered appeals process. Um, so there's a litany of, of uh, you know, violations that we've documented in the military courts that, in our view, make them very unsuitable for trying civilians. I'm going to link that that article and the video reel because I think it's so worth reading and watching because you you've eloquently outlined the structural problems at reforming. The Lebanese state vis-a-vis -vis human rights and I think uh, it's worth it's worth rereading and and there's one thing you brought up at the end and I want to emphasize it um, and I believe it's a it's a separate piece you wrote uh, Lebanon's military courts have no business trying civilians parliament should pass laws to remove civilians from military jurisdiction which kind of emphasizes the point that these are not trained officials or sorry they're not trained judges these are just right. yeah and I want to get into that they're not leg legally trained uh, sorry yes legally trained uh, is it is it simply that the military courts are doing this by design, that you stifle dissent intentionally this way, or is this just a outdated sort of issue that it's never been properly addressed? I mean, it's hard to ascribe motives or intentions. Mm. You know, the law has been this way for you know, many, many years. Um, but we, you know, Human Rights Watch and many other Lebanese human rights organizations have consistently raised concerns with the makeup of the military court, with the processes of the military court, and with some of the violations that we and other organizations have documented mm. regarding trials of civilians in military court. Um, we've had meetings with the former head of the military court who've made our concerns, you know, very clear. Um, unfortunately, Lebanese Parliament has not taken a decision to remove civilians from the jurisdiction of the military court. And sorry, can um, I just ask, at a time, just sorry, Kendal Khatib's case is under that jurisdiction. Yes, right. The, the military prosecutor 
has been increasingly resorting to the military court in order to prosecute individuals who are, quote unquote, uh, tarnishing the reputation of the army, harming the reputation of the army, you know, right, those right. kinds of uh, those kinds of charges. So it does seem to be used as a tool in order to stifle dissent, particularly, you know, against the military institution, even when that criticism is legitimate and it's, you know, founded in credible evidence and allegations. And, and if this were to change, it would have to go through the Lebanese parliament. There's, it, it would have yeah. to be addressed that way. And there's been no... I'm, I'm curious in your interactions with previous regimes and the current regime, is this even on the table in terms of enacting reform, at least when it comes to that particular issue? I mean, do, do you have people, do you have a receptive audience? Yes and no. So the, so the former head of the military court, Brigadier General Hussein Abdullah, he was quite receptive to our engagement with him around the issue of particularly trying journalists in military court. So mm -hmm. there were several cases where journalists who criticized the army ended up being prosecuted in military court. And what Brigadier General Hassan Abdullah started doing was started to declare non-jurisdiction over these cases and refer them back to the civilian judiciary. Right. Okay. But that was something that he took on his own initiative right. rather right. than, you know, the law says that you should do that. That was a, uh, you know, personal mm decision that he made to save himself the trouble of being criticized by the media for trying civilians and journalists in particular in military court. He decided to just do away with the hassle and refer, declare non-jurisdiction and refer the cases to the civilian judiciary. So that's really out but of his own personal, have, personal initiative, otherwise it wouldn't have happened. Right. Yeah. And it's oh. because he had a, a, you know, a, he sentenced a prominent journalist, Hanin Ghaddad, who's based in Washington, D.C., You are the, six you, months. You are now my favorite <laughs> guest. You know why? All you do is segues for me. That was going to be my next point. She's right. referenced even at the top of that piece. It's a yes. quote from her. It reminds me so much of the years I was on the streets of Beirut protesting, in my respect, similar grievances. So it took yeah. me back to 2005. And Hanin, she's a classmate of mine at AUB. We actually studied Middle East studies together at AUB, wow. and this is many years ago. So I, I kind of, I mean, it just for me, it was a bit personal. Hence, I, I read it maybe too many times. Mm -hmm. So yeah, please, <laughs> it, going back to Hanin's case, which is an important one. I think it's actually yeah, it's, probably it's the a most very important one. Yeah. Um, and it yeah. generated a lot of backlash against the military court. So the, the military court sentenced Hanin Ghaddad to six months imprisonment for right. her critis for remarks that she made that were deemed to be critical of the army uh, in absentia. She was in D.C. at the time. Yes. And there was, you know, a huge media backlash both in Lebanon and internationally. Um, and as a result, the Brigadier General Hassan Abdullah was supposed to fly to the U.S. and his visa got cancelled to the US. Right. As a result of that case. Um, as a result of that case. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so after that, he made the decision to, as you know, he said to me, avoid this headache and just start referring these cases to the, um, to the civilian judiciary. Well, that's interesting. So it's almost like there was enough pressure to make that reversal, but that only depends on one particular person willing to do it right otherwise exactly. it, nothing that was there's nothing legally that was changed in, in the way mm -hmm. right exactly can i get to um, the so issue we have a new head of the military court now and yes. it remains to be seen whether he'll take the same approach or not i'm gonna just go one step back in terms of truth and that's mm -hmm. that's not even if you're saying the truth you can still be detained can you expand on that what, is, what does that mean exactly does it have to be tied in with a defamation or is it just the truth on its own is enough to get you in jail? So let's say I call you a liar and you indeed had, you know, I had evidence that you lied about something. I can still, you know, whether or not you lied is irrelevant because I used an insult against you. I called you a liar. Right. Um, and therefore I, I'm, I could be criminally liable for that if you decided to file a complaint against me. But can I ask you just theoretically, if if I uh, if I committed a crime and it's documented, and you and you share that information saying he's a criminal, is that also enough to put me? Uh, sorry, to put you 
in jail for just calling me a criminal. So it's a very yeah. loose, loose definition of uh, yeah. defamation. It's probably a very thin. So I, yeah. I can call. I can say you committed a crime and point to the evidence. Right. But if I say you're a criminal, I'm insulting you. I'm ascribing a, you know, a, a, a adjective to you. I see. Um, and that doesn't matter if it's true or not. Um, that's not a defense. And this is where it becomes cherry picking, where the where individuals can abuse this to their advantage. And right, right. Exactly. But I mean, what we documented is that a lot of these cases never even reach. Uh, they never even reach the judiciary. They usually end after the investigation. So what happens is a person gets a call from let's say the Cyber Crimes Bureau, right. a WhatsApp call. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> really, do they call on WhatsApp? Yes. Are you kidding? Yes. No. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, so that's some crazy. people get a WhatsApp call. Uh, Hello, this is the Cyber Crimes Bureau. We're calling you in for an investigation or for a cup of coffee uh, tomorrow at whatever time. You know, what did I do? Why am I being called in? I don't know, you'll find out tomorrow. So basically what we found is that the law itself is extremely problematic, but yeah. equally problematic are the procedural irregularities that we documented at every stage of the investigation in the criminal defamation cases that we documented. So we documented that the prosecution and security agencies often didn't follow standard procedures and in many instances actually violated the law. So for example, a lot of individuals who were sued for defamation, were arrested in quite a violent way by armed guards in a way that was really vastly disproportionate to their alleged crime, which is defamation. So, you know, one example that really always comes to my mind is the arrest of Hazim Al Amin. He's the co founder and editor in chief of uh, Daraj. Mm, yes. And he was. Accused, he, some person filed a complaint, a defamation complaint against him. So one day, 10 armed police officers from the internal security forces storm his offices uh, and arrest him. Um, and they, I mean, they are in military formation, they're you know, fully armed, and they're going to arrest a journalist. Um, so Al Amin said, Hazim told us, the way that they were driving in the street then, the sirens and the convoy, you'd think that they caught Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, not the journalist. <laughs> um, and then we also documented interrogators using tactics that were physically or psychologically violent during the interrogations. So people were insulted, people were humiliated, they made fun of the way that people looked, they uh, threatened to use personal information against some people so that you know there was a lot of abuse in the interrogation itself yeah. and on several occasions um, the defendants told us that the interrogators violated their privacy and looked through their phones and their whatsapp conversations and their social media accounts even uh, without a judicial order to do so and that's illegal and they used um, the defamation sort of terminology there you said you you yeah. were right right yeah and and even though I mean it's a public post that you're accused of defamation yeah. and there's really no need for a lengthy investigation and looking through other you know other social media accounts and other posts I mean that to me seems just like an excuse to invade somebody's privacy rather than a legitimate aim of a defamation investigation I mean sure. by definition if you committed defamation, you said something in a public forum. So there shouldn't be a need to go through somebody's social media accounts and go through their phones to investigate a crime that by its nature is public. From your, from your experience, are they just simply looking at Instagram posts and, and tweets? Is that kind of the, at the, the sophistication involved? That they just sort I mean, of, because I'm curious what, that's such a severe uptick in cases. I mean, we're talking thousands over a very, very short period of time. And I, I, I'm assuming they're all just sort of either tweets or retweets or very simple posts that suddenly you're getting a, a WhatsApp call as a result of that. Is, is it that they just sort of monitor these platforms and look? Or are they being sort of, are they being reported? Yeah. I mean, how, how does it work? So we did try to investigate to see if there was any evidence of surveillance being mm -hmm. used to track these people. 
and we didn't find any evidence of that. Mm. In the cases that we documented, it was usually the aggrieved person, so the person who thinks right. that they were defamed, right. filing a complaint with the public prosecution against the person who allegedly defamed them. I see. Um, in some cases, though, uh, so in the case of uh, if the defamation was committed against the president, the public prosecutor can himself uh, initiate uh, uh, an investigation. So the president doesn't have to complain or right. file a complaint. The public prosecutor can himself initiate a complaint as a matter of public interest. Um, and that's the order that we saw a few days ago from the public prosecutor. So the public prosecutor took it upon himself to issue an order telling a security agency to investigate all social media posts that insult the president. And he could do this because our laws say that if the insult or defamation was committed against the president, the president doesn't have to file a personal complaint. It can be initiated as a matter of public interest. And that's, I mean, quite um, bad and not compliant with international standards. And I don't mean to be facetious here. I actually am really asking this mm. honestly. Is it a matter of arresting a million people? I mean, these are, there's so many, I'm, I'm going to just give you a silly example. Uh, Michel Chamon's video rant on Instagram, his sort of, his rage at mm -hmm. the collapse of, of Lebanon. And despite it being deleted from his side, it's been shared by thousands, if not more, and people are still able to look at it online. So what do you do? Do you chase down everyone who's retweeted or reposted that video? Or is it really just yeah. a maybe sloppy form of intimidation, hoping that this, gener that this creates enough fear that people will stop doing this? I think, it is the, I think it's the latter. So mm. there's no way that they have the capabilities or I think the will to go after every single person who's shared, the, yeah. shared the tweet. But by creating an environment where people are constantly afraid that what they say may end up, may end them, quit them, yeah. uh, you know, in, in a security agency for investigation, that itself creates a chilling effect on free speech in the country. Right. So, I mean, I, I've started thinking twice before posting something. Um, you know, usually I try to, that you know, post anything that I w would have posted anyway, but the recent, you know, very sharp increase in the number of summons and prosecutions for social media posts does make any reasonable person think twice. And that's why it's so dangerous. And that's what we tried to say in our report, that yes, actually the number of people who have gone to prison for defamation is quite low, but that's sort of irrelevant. You know, you're, there's a climate of intimidation and fear that doesn't need to be taken to the courts. Just by calling in, you know, calling randomly right. calling in people for investigation, you don't know what tweets could land you could land you in a, a prison cell. You don't know um, what's okay and what's not okay. You don't, you know, what's okay today might not be okay tomorrow. Sure. Um, so yeah. this kind of arbitrary nature of the of the prosecution is also in itself creating a climate of intimidation. Um, so Lebanon can still get away with being one of the freest countries in the Arab world because we don't jail our dissidents. But they're doing, you know, they're, they're silencing people before they even get to that place. Um, yeah. And after, you know, after these investigations where we've documented, you know, people stay for eight hours, sometimes overnight. Right, right. Um, they, they're usually forced to sign pledges yeah. saying that they're going to remove a post or pledge not to insult so-and-so person in the future. I mean, that those pledges are also quite problematic because here you're, um, you know, you're, you're being forced to remove something before you even appear before a court, before a judge decides that whether or, you know, whether or not this post constitutes defamation. You're already being silenced. And after the investigation, most people don't know where the case is. So they say, okay, you're free to go now. You'll hear from us, you know, about a court date. Many, most people actually, whose cases we documented, never heard back. But that's constantly mm -hmm. something that's in the back of their minds. It's constantly something that they're thinking about. That's constantly something that, you know, may deter them from posting again about the same person. You know, people will say, I already have 
a case against me by you know so and so politician and no should be I'm not gonna tweet about them again because they may feel that they're being you know monitored more because there's an ongoing case or they just don't want to go through this pretty horrific experience again so you yourself you become you know even if you don't feel it you start self-censoring you start you know one person told us you know I used to you know I used to just post without thinking now I don't think five times I don't think ten times I think a million times before I post something that could be interpreted as being insulting or offensive to public figures um, and that's you know stifling very necessary public debate that we need in Lebanon, particularly at this very critical juncture when the economy is falling apart, the social fabric of society is falling apart, um, and we're, we're, we're not seeing any real leadership to get us out of this crisis, and, you know, the, quite the opposite. We're just seeing parties fighting amongst themselves to divide what remains of, of the spoils. It's a very bleak uh, assessment of where we are. But it's it's an honest sort of take, and I, I'm glad that you even said yourself that at times you may hesitate at posting something, not because you don't want to, but because you don't want to. It is not just a simple phone call or a WhatsApp call. It's it's proper intimidation that you're being yeah. watched, and uh, I think at the same time, and I, maybe you may agree or disagree. I don't know that the ability for a number of people to show up very quickly and defend somebody like Michel Chamon and block a highway and, and even sort of demand that individual's release, putting pressure may be the only salvageable sort of thing we have left, that people are engaged to the point that they're not retweeting or sharing only, that they're actually trying to get him out. But that can only happen, maybe that, that cannot be repeated too much before people literally start staying away from the scene that people get tired, their patience runs course. But I think that's the only thing that sort of stands in the way of complete sort of intimidation. As long as there's a, yeah. that, that politics of fear, I think it's being chipped at gradually, but at the same time, it's almost like it's glued back together by the regime when needed. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a good thing, you know, the good phenomenon that we've started seeing since October 17. Yeah. So before October 17, loads of journalists and activists would go to a security agency for interrogation, spend several hours there and leave, and nobody would know or care because it, it just wasn't, uh, you know, a very public issue. Right. Yeah. But after October 17, we have started seeing calls by activists and other individuals to protest in front of the security agency where right. the person was being investigated is right. being held. Um, you know, and that, that's really positive because they, that leads to media coverage, that leads to some you know, international pressure, that leads to you know, just, just a, a feeling that people are aware, people are watching, and this isn't going to go unnoticed. Right. And, and the, and the, the, the good work of groups like Human Rights Watch and your own work, documenting it and making it as accessible as possible. I think that feeds in right. all the time. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, we've, we've really tried to make sure that we are documenting most of these cases, that people who go through these often very traumatic experiences um, can, can, you know, talk about their experience, they can right. have their stories heard and then reflected in our reporting. Right. But obviously that's not enough. What we really need in Lebanon is a change in the laws. So our laws are vague, they're outdated, they're broad, and they're being used as a tool for retaliation by political parties and religious institutions against people who are criticizing them. Um, and, you know, in, in a sense, the laws exist. So it's within a person's right to file a defamation claim against somebody who they think has wronged them. Right. Um, unfortunately, our laws go much further and they're extremely punitive. So what we've been trying to do in collaboration with you know, a bunch of other human rights and media freedom organizations in Lebanon is try to advocate with Parliament to change the law. Now, there is a law in Parliament that's being debated. It's called the New Media Law. Mm. And the law was introduced more than 10 years ago by MP, former MP Rassan al who has championed, yeah, yeah, <laughs> championed you know, a lot of human rights issues in Lebanon, as mm. well as Maharat, uh, a very prominent free speech NGO here in Lebanon. 
And they introduced this law more than 10 years ago in order to change some of the punitive you know, measures around defamation and insults and bring our national law more in line with international regulations. Right, right. Um, unfortunately, this law has been debated and changed so many times in Parliament that the version, the draft that we have now would actually further restrict freedom of expression rather than expand the space for freedom of expression. So it's it establishes crimes where there previously were none. It increases penalties for some defamation. It's made, before we didn't have any provisions for repeat offenses. Now, if you're if you're accused twice of defamation, let's say the penalty the second time is higher. Um, the fines are much higher than they were before. Mm. So, anyway, the, the law is quite um, you know it, it's not it does not abide by Lebanon's obligations under international law and it would set us back many years rather than move us forward. So as a group of NGOs we're trying to advocate with the parliamentary committee where the law is currently being debated to try to change the very problematic provisions of the law and bring it more in line with international standards. But unfortunately hmm. um, and this is reflective of the way that the government works with civil society. Um, Parliament has not been very transparent with us at all. I mean, the method of interaction is not transparent and it's not, uh, it's not based on a meaningful consultation or partnership with civil society. You know, as an example of the lack of transparency, we've been asking for the latest draft of this law that's currently being debated, a law that will affect the entire media, media sector, and it's not been shared with us. We obtained a leaked version in April 2019, so more than a year ago, and it was a leaked version. It wasn't officially given to us by a parliamentarian. Yet, we were asked by Parliament, as civil society, to comment on the law. And they said, well, you don't need to see the law, you can just give us broad principles. And then they gave us only four days to comment. Um, so really, it's just a you know tick you know check tick box exercise rather than a genuine attempt at consulting civil society about this law. And they don't and show you they don't show you the law. It's really just I, we haven't seen it. You've never seen it. So yeah, we, I yeah. mean, we've seen we've seen the leaked version from last year. Right. I don't think it's been amended too much. But a it was a leaked version. It wasn't given. You know, we didn't have an official copy that was given to us by uh, Parliament, and it might have changed since then, but. We don't know because they're refusing to share the latest version with us, um, and this raises, you know, a lot of concerns about access to information in Lebanon. So we have sure. this yeah. access to information law that was passed in 2017, um, but it's not being applied. It's, uh, you know, the law was passed without setting the resources within each state institution to be able to to provide the information that's requested. So a lot of information is not in digital format, so it's literally impossible to get this information. Um, yet they passed this law because they need, the international community needed to see that we had an access to information law.